Happy Thursday, everybody. I hope all of you are doing well. For those that are in the Mineral County, Allegheny County, anywhere on this part of the country, my thoughts and prayers are with you as we've had a, an enormous amount of rain today, um, thanks to the remnants of Hurricane Ida, along with other storm fronts. So those of you that are in flood areas, my thoughts are with you. Please be safe. For all of those first responders that have been out helping with incidences throughout the day, we thank you for your service, and we are grateful to have all of you. This week's message was the start of a two-part message on three very interesting teenagers. Their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they are very faithful individuals that were put in a very difficult situation. Um, today's story comes from the prophet Daniel, one of the major prophets of the Old Testament. Um, the term major prophet and minor prophets are thrown around when we talk about prophets of the Old Testament. And there's a lot of confusion often that goes with uh, the difference between a major and minor prophet. Um, it has nothing to do with like a level of achievement that they have obtained. It mainly has to do with the length um, of the book itself. The book of Daniel is written by Daniel. And it is written in his time of Jewish exile of Israel in Babylon. Uh, Daniel presents a strong case for the absolute sovereignty of God, even in the face of self-absorbed foreign powers. So you might wonder what this has to do with three teenagers. Um, these three teenagers loved the Lord with every fiber of their being. They were not born into royalty by any means, but they were taken... I'm sorry, they were actually born into royalty. However, they didn't live a royal life because they were taken from their homes and repurposed for the Babylonians. Um, despite the path that they ended up being on, they always maintained their faith in God. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Benny, as I call them, or Rakshak and Benny, um, are first mentioned in the first chapter of Daniel, uh, where they are brought to study the Chaldean language and literature to prepare them to better serve the king's court. The training ended up being about three years long. The goal of this training was to try to force them out of their Hebrew roots and heritage, um, making sure that they were in doctrine into the Babylonian lifestyle. Their Hebrew names were actually replaced with their Chaldean names, um, so the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not their original names. Their original names are Hananiah, meaning Yahweh is gracious, Mishael, meaning who is like Yahweh, and Az um, Azariah, meaning Yahweh has helped. Calvin wrote that Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king, knew that the Jews were a stiff neck and obstinate people, and that he used the sumptuous food to soften up the captives. This amuses me because I think um, this was very much the same strategy that Satan tended to use on us today. Um, there is this ability of Satan to try to indoctrinate us or corrupt us into feeding off of the ways of the world. We tend to get wrapped up in ways of the world when we are not of the world. Um, we tend to find it more pleasing to identify ourselves um, when it comes to certain references within the world. And we tend to educate ourselves in the ways of the world instead of remembering constantly that we are not of this world. King Nebuchadnezzar is known by historians as one of the most influential and the longest reigning king of the Neo-Babylonian period. Nebuchadnezzar conducted the city of Babylon to its height of power and prosperity. He destroyed Jerusalem in 526 BC and led away many Hebrews into captivity in Babylon. He considered himself a spiritual man. Um, he did not really consider himself a religious man. As I've said before in multiple, multiple messages, there is a huge difference between spirituality and religion. Um, this man rebuilt pagan temples. Um, and although Nebuchadnezzar thought of himself as a great ruler, he was really merely just a player in God's uh, bigger plan. So before we get into today's reading, uh, I want to give you a little background. Today's reading comes from Daniel chapter 3, um, 
But I want to look into the first couple of chapters to give you an understanding of how Daniel and the three boys play a huge part of this main story that we're going to dive into. Um, so Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego um, are all part of this. Earlier in the book of Daniel, Daniel and these three boys are first tempted when they were at their training um, to get rid of their Hebrew roots and culture and their being indoctrinated into the Babylonian lifestyle. They were told they could eat and drink the same things that the king did. Well, what the king ate and drank went against their Jewish or their Hebrew dietary restrictions, we'll call it, or dietary norm. Um, and Daniel managed to find a way to convince the sewer, stewards of the court to give him and the, four bo the three boys a 10-day um, trial period where the stewards allowed them to eat what they would normally eat while the others ate the king's diet and then we would see who was kind of more physically fit. Well, at the, after the end of 10 days, which was how long the trial period was, Daniel and the three boys ended up being in much better condition than everyone else who was eating the same things the kings ate. So the stewards actually took away the dietary options from the king for everyone else and they were, you know, allowed to eat their normal Hebrew diet. Um, and then God also, we have to understand that God gives us spiritual gifts. Every one of us created have been created with very specific gifts and talents. Um, these four individuals, Daniel and the three boys, had talents themselves. Daniel, the prophet Daniel, had the understanding of all visions and dreams and, were, and became a very crucial part when it came to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that's, and he needed someone to interpret this dream. He tried magicians, sorcerers, Chaldeans. No one could inter interpret this dream and he was actually losing sleep over this dream. He ended up starting to threaten to cut up people if someone couldn't interpret this dream, which let's be honest here. How is that helping you? You know, God gives Daniel the ability to interpret this dream. Daniel describes this great image made of different materials such as fine gold, silver, bronze, iron. Um, the king is described as a head of gold and God will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Um, it broke into pieces the iron, bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. This describes a single decisive event that would shatter the image representing the glory of man's rule on earth. The kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. The king ended up falling down at David's feet and kind of worshiping David for David being, or I'm sorry, Daniel, for Daniel being able to interpret this dream. Um, so we need to keep that in mind that instead of giving glory to God for Daniel's ability to interpret his dream, he actually worships Daniel, which not really what Daniel was after. So today's reading comes from Daniel chapter three. This is the first 15 verses. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold six, 60 cubits high and six cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura and the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, per, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officers to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So all came, assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed nations and peoples of every language. This is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hands? So Nebuchadnezzar wanted to celebrate the news that the God of heaven had given him this kingdom, as well as all of this power and glory and strength. So what did he choose to do? Did he cho choose to hold a festi festival in God's honor? Absolutely not. Why would we do that? No. Instead, he chose to construct a golden image as an object of worship. That's a big no-no. The idol stood 90 feet tall, um, to give you an idea, we have a statue in the U.S. over in Butte, Montana, and it's the Our Lady of the Rocky statue. That's also 90 feet tall, so if any of you know that statue off the top of your head, it's a pretty big statue, right? Now, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar built was not technically solid gold because that would have been very prohibitive, but the, the image itself would have been coated in gold, um, and it was located around nine miles from Babylon. Now, there have been discussions and studies to figure out why the statue was even built. There are some that think that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to start a new religion, and in doing so, he felt that if you didn't accept this religion, it was considered to be an act of treason and punishable by death. Now, at this point, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had, promo had been promoted within the king's court. They were technically considered advisors. Um, and the Chaldeans were not happy that these three teenagers were promoted. I mean, they, after all, they're teenagers. And so they were realistically looking for a way to get rid of these three. They accused the three boys of disrespecting the king by telling the king that they do not pay any attention to you, O king. Um, they were accused of being disloyal because they refused to serve the king's gods. And they are accused of disobedience because they will not bow down and worship the idol. Now, you can make the argument that two of those charges are partially true. They refuse to serve the king's gods. And they technically, you know, were disobedient because they would not bow down and worship this idol. However, the first accusation that they didn't have any um, respect for the king and were not, um, well, I guess were not respectful of the king is technically not entirely true. After all, they did show up to the dedication ceremony of this idol. So, I mean, they made sure that they were loyal to the land and they made sure in almost all aspects uh, they were serving the king faithfully, but they refused to break the first commandment that they are taught. And the first commandment that they are taught is, thou shall have no other gods before me. So they're not going to go away from that very first commandment that all Hebrews are taught from a young age. Now, to give Nebuchadnezzar some credit, even after his other advisors came and tried to, you know, badmouth these three, yes, Nebuchadnezzar was angry, but he didn't accept the accusations purely as hearsay. He decided he wanted to have a personal meeting with all three boys, so he sent for all three to come. It's hard enough Today, especially being a Christ follower, it is hard enough at any point in time to be able in the point where you know you're going to face backlash, you're going to face conflict, and you could also face a lot of harshness to be able to stand up and say that you are a child of God. That is not an easy thing to do, especially today in our world. There are so many bad examples of Christ followers in the world that that is what folks tend to hold against the rest of us. And the rest of us are too busy trying to fight against hate towards us 
because there are some bad apples. But it can be even harder to make that kind of statement that you are a child of God when you are facing potential death, okay? Even Peter could not say that he was one of Jesus' disciples when Jesus was condemned to death because Peter knew that if he said he was, he'd be killed too. He denied Jesus three times and then had to deal with that guilt afterwards. These three boys in the face of death refused to compromise their religious beliefs and instead demonstrated courage and faith in God. Nebuchadnezzar threatened to throw them into a furnace. Charles Spurgeon wrote, do not judge the situation by the king's threat and by the heat of the burning fiery furnace, but by the everlasting God and the eternal life which awaits you. Let not flute, harp, and sack but fascinate you, but hearken to the music of the glorified. Men frown at you, but you can see God smiling on you, and so you are now moved. Nebuchadnezzar's anger at their lack of respect of the idol he had constructed had nothing to actually do with that idol. Had nothing to do with a potential new religion. Nebuchadnezzar didn't care about the gods of Babylon. He didn't. But he saw their unwillingness to worship this idol as also being unwilling to worship him as a god figure. Next week, we're going to see the continuation of this. We're going to see what happens when you stand firm and faithful. But how many of us have been in a situation like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How many of us have been tempted to participate in something that goes against the teachings of our holy scriptures, and we have to make a choice? What did you choose? Or what now do you, do you have to live with as a regret? because of a choice you made or a choice you didn't make. In the world today, there are many ways that we are often manipulated and pulled in directions where folks attempt to skew reality with exaggerated facts, hate, conspiracy, authority, and ego. What we often don't realize, and yes, this goes for me as well, is we often are part of the problem. We get so focused in this narrow viewpoint that we fall into the trap and then blame others when they will not follow what we want them to do. We get angry and want a type of justice for actions that are done against us. Um, we can start moving forward today and we can choose to change that mindset. We can choose to either shift it, or we can be like Nebuchadnezzar, where our power, our egos, our pride, our thoughts are all that matter, and anyone who thinks differently from us needs to be destroyed. Or we can think like these three teenagers, where we put our faith in God in the face of adversity, potential death, and stand up for what's right, truly allowing God to lead us, not allowing the worldly things to lead us. I look forward to seeing you all on Sunday for the final part of Shadrach, Meshach, and Benny. Bye.